Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tips podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks, and today I'm talking to Gary Moore. Gary's a sound recordist for the Natural History Unit. He's worked all over the world on various productions and he's even popped up on some of the watches every now and again in front of the camera. But before we chat to Gary, we're going to talk a little bit about the news. Now, I don't normally cover celebrity news uh, in my podcast because it's not got much relevance. However, I did see that uh, David Beckham and Victoria Beckham have got planning permission for a 91 metre garden lake. I'd say garden pond would be a little, <laughs> a little bit of an understatement. Uh, and they've got the go ahead providing they don't stock it with fish. This is in the Cotswolds and a few other provisories is that they have to maintain lighting low so it doesn't affect bats. They also do refuges for hedgehogs, reptiles and amphibians. But the idea is that they can have this lake as long as they encourage it for wildlife. Now, hopefully, this doesn't end up like the Ed Sheeran uh, affair. And if some of you might remember that last year, I think it was, Ed Sheeran had a, a wildlife pond, inverted brackets, in his uh, in his garden. And it was actually a swimming pool. And that was not, they, he didn't have permission for that. And he was, oh, no, it is for wildlife, even though it had steps, a handrail, and a jetty <laughs> leading into it. So I think he was clutching at straws a little bit there. As after he was having wild parties in there, um, I don't think that you're going to be getting great crested newts in that particular pond. So it's great to see popular figures promoting the use of a wildlife lake, or for most of us it'd be a wildlife pond, but a lake in their case. So that's good to see. Anyway, let's get to our guest today, Gary Moore. So we're going to talk a little bit about how sound recording works, some of the specialist equipment that he uses, the practicalities of it. Uh, hints and tips, but also a little bit what goes on behind the scenes. So here's how me and Gary got on. Well, Gary, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. And uh, we've we've met a couple of times on watcher shoots, haven't we? I'm trying to remember. I think the first one was in Monmouthshire, if I remember, ages ago now. It was. And what were we doing? It was quite. It's quite a difficult shoot, wasn't it? It was. It would hopefully shad. We didn't get any, but it was. I think it was more a passionate person piece than the actual yeah. fish but I remember seeing your van and it was like yeah. a studio apartment it was it just had all these bits in it and you you had a bed in there I think I did well Jack I was admired you because you went everywhere then on public transport and yeah. I thought that was fantastic you were loaded up you had your fins you had all your gear and I think that's amazing there were you know I didn't know anybody else who was carried so much kit and was so <laughs> dead and getting on public transport Mate, I've got to tell you, I totally admire you. I think I was fantastic. I really do. I do. I, yeah, it's good to be uh, greener, I guess, but I don't miss lugging all that gear on the train, definitely. I've got a car now, which does get me to A to B. But yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting in the early days. Uh, Remember you telling me about the looks you'd get from Oh, the yeah. Visual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you like, you know. <laughs> that just shows dedication. I think that's brilliant. You know, absolutely brilliant. Just go show, don't let transport, don't have a car stop you from pursuing what you want to do. No, no, and, and it's surprising if you look into it, you can get most places, there's, there's always a way, if, you, you know, if you're really dedicated and, and you're keen, you'll, you'll find a way to get, get to those places. Yeah. But we're going to talk about a little bit about the work you do. So what drew you to sound recording? As it's, it's not always the first choice for many people who want to get into TV. They always tend to gravitate towards presenting or, or camera work. So, so why sound recording? Well, when I retire, Jack, I'm going to blow the lid of wildlife filmmaking and sound. <laughs> Just the of it is fake. I'm going to be honest with you, right? And so when I, when I finished my degree, I went to work to, at the Bristol as a researcher. And because I worked in natural history, a vast majority of the sound that's put on all of these wonderful blue chip programs, I'm sorry, it's fake. It's not <laughs> location. And so... I saw there was a real niche there, you know. I mean, it was difficult trying to persuade the producers to go with live sound. It was often the job that was given to the researcher, you know. It was so far down the pecking list of their things to do that I thought, hang on a minute, you know, being multi-skilled is a good thing. So I, when I was at university, I boom swing for a guy in Manchester. So I had a, an eye or an ear for sound. And, and, and be, working in natural history TV, sound is always neglected. You know, it's never put on until you're in the edit when they realise they've not got the sound of that various crane or we've not got the sound of that underwater shot you know let's face it how much fake underwater sound do we put on underwater shots i mean you must drive you mad yeah are there we do have the equipment to record 
proper underwater, you know, recording on location with that species, you know. And there's a couple of times when I've done it and it's just been absolutely amazing. And it just adds so much more to the program. And so I realized that, hang on a minute, I'm gonna be a, a, a researcher who can do sound. But because I'm heavily dyslexic, the whole research thing never really worked for me. No, you know, no. It's difficult. And I'm going back now 25 years, so even then, you know, people communicated via phone, and so it's better. But when, when, when all the email that came in, it was just not my thing, you know. I like face-to-face -face, uh, interactions, and so, I realized that I was probably spending several months in the office for that two week filming trip. Well, I yeah. preferred two week filming trip and not a time in the office. So I then retrained as a recorder. So I went to the BBC training school at Wood Norton. Yeah, so I retrained as a recorder. So then I came back and I was, I was a researcher who could do sound. You know, our industry, Jack, as you well know, is very, very difficult to get into. Yeah. But very, oh, that's the other thing as well. Um, so I always think being multi-skilled, having as many, you know, tricks under your belt as you can makes you more employable. And especially if sound was neglected, it meant that I could go away on shoots, I could be the researcher, and I could also do good quality location recording. And in the early days, I worked I worked for 12 years with Bilotti. I worked oh. on the Bilotti series, and early on, I was the researcher that would go with the wildlife cameraman, and we would shoot the wildlife stuff, and I'd record proper sound on location. I mean, we need to talk about long lenses and, 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 and you know and bird song and sound because as soon as you bring a long lens into the game the chances are you know whatever you're filming uh, for as a recordist we don't have the long lens we have techniques we have field craft you know the closest thing we've got I guess is my parabolic reflector that's how I get you know sound from distance particularly bird song yeah. from distance yeah I mean it's a whole minefield it, 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 there's still room for improvement still and, and amongst some of the programs you would think you know, are the big blue chip programs, the programs that, you know, track the biggest audiences. I'm going to say it, and I shouldn't say it, but often have the worst sound on them, from my perspective. All right. I suppose you've got an ear for it, though, haven't you? Like, I suppose the general public might not pick up on it, but you're going to be like, oh, hang on. Yeah, I mean, come on, Jack. If you see some underwater shots, right, and you're yeah. seeing great shots, and you can see there's a waterfall, something in the background, you see bubbles, you know. If you can't hear it, you know what it's like. As soon as you put your head underwater, you know what it's like. You know instantly if that sound's not right. It yeah. just stands out some fake, some library sound that the editor's got in his dub and he's just added on a little few bubbles and a few plops. It's absolutely ridiculous. After you use, but wherever you put in the underwater housing, you do get a little bit of sound, don't you? But it's still not brilliant, is it? Yeah, you get a bit, but it, it's normally just kind of, shh, shh, you yeah. know, because you, I've been in the rivers mostly. But yeah, you don't you don't hear um, a great deal. But I was going to talk to you about that actually because I think it was. I can't remember if it was Blue Planet 2 or one of them. They were recording sound on reefs, weren't they, with fish making noises. Uh, I don't know who did that, but there were a lot of fish do talk to each other, but you don't really hear it. Right? You'd have to use specialist equipment, I guess, to pick it up properly, yeah. but they, a lot of clicks, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I know Cod, Grunt, that's yeah. a recording bird, but I don't think I saw that reef one. I know, I think I saw it. Um, but I mean, there'll be scientists in the lab who would have recorded that. So this is my look. I don't know, and I could be proved, proven wrong, but my gut theory is that there have been scientists working on that, and they may well have been recorded in the lab and then dubbed over the top. Hey, um, listen, if it's done, brilliant. Yeah. You know, but I, basically, if there's a cameraman down there, chances are you've got a boat sitting above. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Water. But the, one of the other problems is, is water splashing on the side of the boat. That just travels. Remember, sound travels five times faster through water than it does through air because it's a denser medium. Yeah. And so you have, you know, if you've got if you've got the dive boat, let's say 50 meters away, if the if the waves are just lapping and hitting the side of the boat, that travels straight down to that reef. Yeah. So my feeling is is that I don't know, it could be proven wrong, but I think that would have been recorded separately. And do you know the best way to tell? When you no. see the credit, look for a sound recordist. If there's no sound recorder's name in the credits, chances are it's fake. Ah, there. okay. You've blown it. You've blown the lid wide. <laughs> when I retire, I'm going to do wildlife sound unplugged, and I'm going to blow it right out. <laughs> when when I was learning at uni, uh, the the guy who taught us was like, he kind of told us all about the all the things that go behind the scenes on wildlife filmmaking and it it doesn't ruin the experience. But you know, like if you're watching a chase, like lions chasing a wildebeest or something, you're like, oh well. 
that's a different lion, that's a different wildebeest, or that one definitely didn't get away, it would have got eaten, but for the sake of the story, you know, and it's, it, I can't watch a program now and be like, oh, I know how that was done, or I knew how they did that, and it, you know. I mean, you know, the vast majority of the public don't care, but they no. trust, yeah. you know. And, uh, it's like the classic, any, any chase scene, an yeah. aerial, all right, maybe in the last five or six years, they could be done with drones, and drones are getting silenter. But I can tell you some of those famous chase scenes, there's a helicopter hovering above. And so right. you know that all the audio there is fake, absolutely fake, you know. And, and often a lot of these, you know, animals running are just, you know, you know it's the helicopter in the air, you know it's just all fake. So, yeah. so I, I, I struggle when I see those shots. It distracts for me. I can't watch them. No, because I'm massive heli gimbal, you know, a big a big uh, uh, rig mounted underneath the helicopter, and they're pursuing. Yeah, they really could be they could be high up, you know, they could well be high up, you know, with a long lens on. But then ask yourself, you know, look how high a helicopter is in the sky, and you still hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And always the camera's mounted on the side of a vehicle. It's mounted in a helicopter. In that situation, all the sound that's put on is fake, really, because you know what you're going to do. You're going to have the sound of a Land Rover chasing across. No, yeah, of course not. Yeah, yeah. Or dogs. I mean, people just turn off, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's the compromise, I guess. Well, you might call it artistic license, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. And and you've gone to some pretty extraordinary lengths to get sound of creatures, haven't you? I remember seeing you dress up in a ghillie suit for lap wings. I think it was on Springwatch. And one of them, yeah, you do I mean, kind of. I believe that a lot of the species that we go to film know we're there. They're not stupid. You know, they can see it, they know we're there. And so I have this thing where, okay, so you know, I, I don't make a point of dressing up in a, in a ghillie suit. I don't do that at all. You know, I think the reason that day was because the birds were, were going to go down on eggs. So they were looking for nesting sites. Right. So I just, fairly inconspicuous as possible, just also to just blend in and get the shot. But normally, I build a bond with the animal that I'm trying to film. It's like, okay, so I, there's a distance. There's an acceptable distance that they'll let you approach, right? And then when you encroach upon that, let's, let's talk about birds, because birds are what I, you know, 95% of what I do is birds, basically. So if there's a bird singing on a perch, right, I want to get a nice, crisp, clean recording of that bird, right? And I know there's only so far that bird's going to let me approach it before it stops singing, right? And I don't ever want to get to that stage, because as soon as the bird stops singing, it's messed my recording up. That's not what I want. I want natural behaviour from that bird, Right, and I will also get a good clean recording. So they know you're there. You know, you could creep around in a, in, in camouflage and that and it works. You know, I remember Yolo telling me, look at Yolo, right? He's one of the best birders I know. He walks around in a bright blue cabal. <laughs> great for a relationship with all the animals that he tour guides in Leeds or you know, with birding, because you just you just accept it, you know. Yeah. yeah, you know, I'm there and let's just get that bond going. So that's the way I like to do it really, you know. There are rare occasions, yes. And, and for wildlife, I can see the importance of a hide. So it does work, you know, but often if you're out in an estuary, you know, or you're out somewhere, just a bit of field craft. Just yeah. practice your field. A little bit of technical ability mixed with a little bit of field craft. And I think you get the results, you know. We had uh, Hugh Miles on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he said the same thing. Like He'd build up a bond with an animal, uh, whether it was yeah. the pumas he did in Chile or, or otters in Shetland. And that's how he got a lot of the shots he was really happy with just because they, they sort of knew they'd sit next to him and, you know, take, not everyone's able to do that, I suppose, because it takes a lot of time, but when you do do it, you reap the rewards of it. Yeah. It does take a lot of time. It yeah. does take a lot of time. But, you know, as you know, Jack, when you do put the effort in, you always get the rewards. Don't you? But that could, be, that could be the bird in your back garden. You know, yeah. if you sit there in the park on a park bench with a bit of bread and a cup of tea, you know, and soon you'll soon get, you will soon get good results, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they, but, you know, yeah, it's, there, there is, there are some areas where now we're looking at putting remote recorders into places and they're yeah. hearing birds that you don't hear when a warden's on the reserve. So uh. just human presence can stop some birds from calling. But again, for me, there are so many other, there are so many factors that surround a good recording. It might be wind direction. It might be the lie of the land might be what's behind your target species because you've got to remember that if you're pointing a microphone at an individual species you're not only recording the bird but you're also recording what's behind it 
So that's all about field craft, about working your way around, putting a neutral background behind it, something that's not going to interfere. Because let's face it, we are the most overflown country in the world. Okay, at the moment things are not like that. But traffic, planes, motorbikes, the up the up already up in here somewhere out there. There's a, there's a disc. There's a, like a some sort of chainsaw or something going yeah. outside that's driving. The ba um, bane of the sound man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think. I, I think probably with the uh, camera intensity light, isn't it? Light yeah. clouds. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, so for me, yeah, it's sort of extreme noises. Lo yeah. Low flowing, low, low flying planes and lawnmowers. I seem to remember being the, the main ball ache. Pretty bad as well. Yeah. Swimmers and leaf. Right. I'm going to get on my soapbox here. I know they're not going to like it, right? But certain councils saying they've got no money, but there they are, burning fossil fuels, blowing leaves around. I just think, how can we justify? burning fossil fuels to blow leaves with a leaf blower. Pick them up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's always crazy. They've got no money, yet they're burning fossil fuels to blow leaves up and down the pavement. Yeah. You know? There's something not right there, is there? No. 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 You... Strimmers, leaf, leaf blowers. I must admit I do own a strimmer, so I'm sort of, sort of a hypocrite. <laughs> And you, you mentioned earlier that you were, you were heavily uh, dyslexic. So I, I'm, I'm dyslexic as well. I'm dyspraxic. So I can definitely sympathize with you. So I think I, was, I remember seeing somewhere you couldn't read or couldn't write very well until you were 27. 20, is that right? 27, so, yeah. so do you think that dyslexia helps you to be more of a creative? Do you think there's any upsides to it? We always hear the negatives of it, but do you think there are any upsides to being dyslexic? Yeah, well, I guess if you look at the research, I mean, Chris, Chris Packham did an amazing uh, documentary uh, about Asperger's, didn't he? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. They looked at Silicon Valley, where they actively seek out people whose brains are just mm. slightly a bit different, and that's what we are. You know, a lot. If you, the more you ask around, you realise a lot of arty people do tend to be, you know, yeah. Often, a lot of dyslexic people I know are quite creative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spatial awareness as well. We've got amazing spatial awareness. For me. Uh, maps and things I was obsessed with maps and I can go somewhere once and get on nine times out of ten I can go there again once I've been there yeah I'm like you know, that yeah yeah yeah, yeah really good really yeah. good space and I, we like maps and we like their ordered things so yeah I mean and but you know yeah I left school at 16 really unable to read or write virtually unable to read or write you know and uh, I did lots of different jobs you know bummed around and then eventually I lived with a guy who was a lecturer at college and he said to me, oh, you know, why don't you come, he teaches out an education course. And he said, oh, why don't you come back, you know, and, and have a go at doing, you know, come to college, do the adult education course. But he didn't know how bad I was. No. So when I was down, I was told that I had to spend two years doing remedial maths and English before I could even attempt the adult education class, which I did. I then did an access course and I then went to university at the age of 30. So don't let anybody you know, and I got a good job. So it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, just pursue it. I realize some people have got commitments, you know, and I, I was lucky, you know, I never, I, uh, I didn't own a home, I didn't have any commitments, you know, so I could make that jump and go to university. But unfortunately, all of the funding and the tools that allowed me to do that no longer exist. No. So I, think, I don't think someone of my age could do what I did 25 years ago and it breaks my heart because i know that there are people out there like us who just you know who are never fulfilled their potential who are probably in a dead-end job and they know they're better they know they you know they can do more but they've just not got the confidence or no one's ever told them that they can do it i think i don't know about you chap but when i grew up i didn't really have any role models you know i didn't know anybody that had been to university i grew up on quite a tough council estate you know i went to a comprehensive school and uh, we were just factory fodder, you know, that's what, that, that's what we were. So I didn't really have any role models. So it, it's hopefully things are a little bit different now, you know. And, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, when I, mean, I was at uni 10 years ago, there was quite, a, I mean, I didn't even know I was dyslexic. At, I, I went for a, just a, a test yeah. and I say test, like it was just to like, talk to you. And um, yeah. I was trying to, because I've got joint problems. So I went to try and get help with that. But what they ended up going, oh, you're dyslexic. I went, am I? And I'd always known something. Not, not, not right, because that's not the right way to look at it, but, you know, something different. And then they were like, yeah, you're dyslexic. And there was quite a lot of help then. But as far as I'm aware now, all the funding for that's gone. You, you no longer get any support. I, I used to have a, a lecturer who would help me and um, yeah. software on my laptop and stuff they gave me. But that's all gone now. So the funding's been cut, which is a real shame. Extra, 
extra time in exams. I think we still get that, don't we? Possibly, yeah, possibly do. Three minutes per hour. So if an exam was three hour exam, I'd get an extra three quarters an hour at the end. Yeah. And you'd always be early before the other students, probably to a different room. But it was more yeah. relaxed. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd find that. I mean, I, I find with, because I don't know how I've done it, but I've done two books and I find that writing in the morning, I'm, I'm great. A couple of hours when I wake up, I can, I can chug along. But as the day goes on, just my attention span just goes and I, I really struggle with it and I have to just wait to the next day. So something that would probably take someone else half a day might take me a week. I'll get there, but it just takes me a little bit longer to, to kind of do it. Yeah, because in the new year, I'm about to embark upon my first book. And, oh, uh, great. I'm, how difficult it is i've sort of written the first three thousand words of my first chapter and i've sent them off to try and get some sort of you know response and they're trying to get a book deal but um yeah so for the first time i'm sitting down well i guess for a new 25 years since i graduated and i'm having to write a lot of words in a day and it's yeah. quite quite tough in it yeah definitely tough. definitely and I've, those, I've tried those dictation things on my laptop you know i've tried those dictating software and I must be honest with you, I've not really got on with it. I don't know about yourself or if anybody else out there has found a really good dictation piece of software, but as a dyslexic writing a book, it's very much one finger. Tap, yeah. Tap, tap. See, I don't, I, I can find if I write with a pen and paper, I'm not too bad. Oh. It's that physical thing I can do, but then obviously you've still got to type it up anyway. But yeah, no, yeah. I, it's the, it's the tapping. I, I can, I can see what you mean by that. So you've, you've heard a lot of sounds. What, what's the best sound you've heard from an animal? What have you heard like, wow, that was incredible? Well, now I'm going to sound quite like a privileged person now, but I'm not really. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, fortunately, working for BBC, we, I have been to some great locations. And I was away in Alaska with Liz Bonin, and we were doing one of her programmes about intelligent animals. And we went to a place called Iking Cove, which is where they do the famous bubble netting of the uh, humpback whales. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, being the sound recordist, I was so far down the pecking order. What I wanted was to sort of like, you know, we've got to get the animals, we've got to get the sync with Liz, we've got to get everything, you know, sound well, that can just, you know, as long as we can hear what Liz says, let's just, you know, crack on. And uh, so usual story, we'd been there, there for a couple of days and they were doing it, you know, and a little bits and bobs and I could hear, when you put a high, well, you could hear through the bottom of the boat, you could hear the female screaming as she drove the fish to the surface. And for me, it was just absolutely amazing. I mean, the boat, it was quite a big boat, but it was a GRP, like a plastic pipe pull on this boat. And when you were down in the galley at the bottom or you were down in the cabins, you could hear the female. She's the female that does it. She screams and drives the fish to the surface. And uh, I hadn't really got it. And they got the sink and they were, woo, we got the sink, it's all happening. <laughs> I'm fine as ever, just sat in the corner thinking, I'm not happy, this isn't working for me. And so when you're with a crew, right, you'll never get them to shut up unless you put a sandwich in their hand, unless they've got something to put in the mouth, right? <laughs> so lunch is all right. They've all gone into the galley. They're all eating. I've gone, no, I'm not doing that. I'm staying on the deck of the boat. And uh, this pod of humpbacks oh, came by within, I don't know, 20 feet at the side of the boat and they were blowing and they were calling and it was absolutely amazing. For the first time, all the crew had gone, they were down below, they were eating the sarnies and the food and the lunch. I got to some fantastic recordings. In fact, I got the boom right out over the blowhole of one of the humpbacks. And um, people think that when you see that jet of uh, water that comes up, uh, there's a jet of steam, they think it's expelling the air from inside of the whale, but it's not. In the blowhole, you get a little bit of residue of water and as it blows out, the water atomizes. That's ah. when you get like of steam or smoke or spray from the top of the whale. And I was so close, that went all over the boom. And it was just absolutely stunning. So for me, I think that's probably one of my highlights. For ah. uh, um, I still didn't get there all the time I wanted. I'd have liked to have got more hydrophones in. I'd like to have got more again. But of course, as the recordist, we've always got a bit of a chip on our shoulder that we're so far down the pecking order when yeah. it comes to eat. But um, yeah, that was pretty yeah. good. And again, I was doing one of the uh, Naomi Nightmares of Nature and we were in Costa Rica and we had howler monkeys at a temple in Costa Rica the first thing in the morning. That was just phenomenal. Absolutely fantastic. And it's believed that um, when they did the original um, 
uh, Jurassic Park, they mixed the call of the Howler Monkeys and slowed it down and somehow adapted it to be the actual sound of many, well, particularly, I think it might have been the T-Rex, I'm not sure, but ah. certainly used dinosaurs in the film. And yeah, how first thing in the morning when it's getting light in a temple in South America is just stunning. Absolutely stunning. What would I like to do in those one is one thing I'd really like to do before the end of my career, and that's to do Birds of Paradise properly. Unfortunately, there's been several programs that have been done, uh, and basically the sound is absolutely dire. You'll always know when they've not got the sound. There were two giveaways. One of them is they'll put dialogue over the bird displaying, and the second is they'll put music over it. And as soon as you hear that, as soon as you hear the voices, you know they've not got the sound of the bird displaying. And why? Because they put a cameraman in a hide, he'll be there for months, he's probably, you know, 50 metres away. Yes, he's got his long telephoto lens, he's got the bird displaying, but they've got no audio to go with it. Uh, and that's unfortunately, I just see through all those. And I just still think the Birds of Paradise done properly with a proper sound recordist would just be amazing. And I'm yeah. yet to see it. Never been done. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's loads of, uh, you know, audio that's not been done on a lot of these, a lot of these subjects. So the, the, the thing that sticks out with me was a, a couple of years ago, I, I went to Dungeness in Kent and we were trying to see bitterns, me and my father-in-law, father-in-law to be, and we could hear one booming on the other side of the, the reed beds. And there were, there were cuckoos going off, there were marsh frogs, it was an amazing soundscape. And then there was a bittern right in front of us, we couldn't see it but we could feel it, the boom. I've never felt anything like it in my life. It reverberated through my rib cage. Just as, brr, brr, brr. It yeah. was just absolutely incredible. And that's probably the first time where I just closed my eyes, wasn't looking at it and just breathed it all in. And I definitely, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted of you, but I definitely encourage people, if you are on a nature reserve, just, just close your eyes for a minute and just breathe it all in. It is an incredible experience. That was something that I'll, I'll never forget. That was, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, I've said it before, I always believe hearing is our first sense, you know. I think we often hear danger, we see, you know, we often hear things before we see it, you know, and that's why I just always get people to just they do exactly what you did in a wood, you know, in a woodland, you know, in a reed bed, anywhere where you want your, you know, your little, your little moment, your little bit of just contemplation, just shut your eyes. Yes, it's great to see things, but just shut your eyes first, just listening, and it adds a whole new dimension to your location. Yeah, definitely. So for anyone who, who is recording, say, bird song or, or deer barreling or whatever, uh, what, what's the most important things to remember? Never stop the organism or the target species doing what it wants to do. Because as soon as you've done that, you've both lost. You've yeah. not got the record on and you've, you've annoyed the animal. The animal's not doing what it's doing. And for a lot of these species, you know, it's their perfect their time to breed. If you interfere with their breeding, that's, that, that's the pinnacle, you know, of their whole lifespan is to reproduce. But if you stop any animal reproducing, forget it. You know, you've got to walk away. You can't do that. You know, it's, it's, far, it's far more important that, you know, the next generation is reproduced rather than you, you know, going home with your recording. Well, you won't get the recording because as soon as you stopped it, you've not got your recording either. So, okay. yeah, I just think respect, respect for, the, for your target species. That's what I think. You know, a bit of field craft, a bit of research. And you, it takes time. But it will come. I mean, you can put remote mics, and I do it. You know, sometimes I think that if I'm not getting what I want and I'm really too close, you know, I'm fit, I'll put a mic in position. I might cover it with a bit of scrim, some bit of snow, some straw, some, some foliage or whatever. Then I'll pull back. You know, I might run a long cable, or I might just put a little radio mic in there. A radio mic's not great because anything sent by a radio signal is compressed. So you're really a bit of copper. You'll never beat a bit of copper between the actual radio, between the capsule, between your microphone and your recorder. Get a bit of copper. Don't, don't don't have a radio link because it's never as good. Okay. Never. You've already mentioned it, I think, but when I see you pop on the watches, you normally have this this large wok looking thing for recording yeah. signed. So how is that different to say something that you'd put on the camera? That's did you say parabolic, was it? Was it a parabolic and it's like a giant some people call it a dustbin lid, some people call it a giant wok. And basically it's a um, it's a large plastic dish that catches the sound and focuses it onto the sweet spot, focuses it onto the capsule that's inside the center of that large plastic dish. Um, it's ancient technology. It's like 1930s technology. Uh, somewhere on the south coast of Conway where I need to go there, there were concrete uh, sound detectors that were meant to detect the sound of on with oncoming aircraft from, from the continent, from France. 
uh, between the wars before radar was developed and that was the same thing because basically what it does it detects high pitch frequencies i mean you wouldn't take it onto a reserve and record a bitten but for lots of passerines perching birds songbirds it's ideal but again it's got its limitations don't take it for deer don't take it for for booming bitten but for high pitch frequencies it's absolutely fine uh, I think I saw you use it for nightingales in Reading or something like that. Was it a services or something you did it? But yeah, that was. Uh... But not really for not really for. So you're better off really if you if you're into deer and things or you're into mammals. Um, I'd say just you know use your mic that comes with your camera if you can get it away from the camera. There's not a lot of handling noise. You know, get a long cable, put it on a spike in the ground. Even if you're in a hide, you know, don't have your mic in the hide with you. Get it on a cable, put it outside. There are a few good cameramen that do that. Uh, there are some that do it. They'll, they'll particularly bring an, you know, an extra mic and put it on the table and stick it outside. Uh, yeah. Lindsay McRae, again, a fantastic cameraman who's really good at that. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think he does it. I think Ian Llewellyn does it when he can. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. Get your mic away from your camera because you, you all know you've done it. You know, you've this best with your camera. You've got the zoom. You've changed the back. Whatever you've done, just physically handling the camera that sounds often transmitted to the microphone so get it off the camera get it on a cable get it outside your hide that's what i'd recommend but again camouflage it you know the problem is though once it's outside the hide if something happens to the right or to the left you can't respond whereas if you have got you know a mic that you can move within the hide um it will help but yeah. uh get it out the hide pros it's and cons to both i guess it's because you're drinking tea and eating biscuits. That's all the <laughs> problem. So before we go then, I think you wanted to uh, have a chat about fishing. Is that right? Oh, I just, you know, you spend a lot of time uh, down the river. And yeah. um, my lad came to me, my 12-year-old came to me. And he says, Dad, Dad, I want to go fishing. Now, you know, I've never fished before. I think I did when I was about 11, but not for very long. And there are all those, what should we say, animal welfare issues around fishing, you know. So I was a little bit, do I want to pull a fish out of the river with a hook in its mouth? I didn't really know how I felt about it, but my little lad clearly wanted to do it. So I was completely torn. You know, yeah. what do I do? So yeah, you know, we've got a little rod, you know, we've got, we've got some sweet corn and we went out to catch a few silverfish. And I saw how he really became hooked by, hooked by the river, the freshwater ecology, species of fish. And he's now, you know, he's got a poster on his bedroom wall of freshwater fish. You know, I mean, He's always liked collecting frog spawn, you know, and he's always, this year he's got some sticklebacks in a little tank, you know, in his front room that he like, you know, looks at every day. But I just think, and I don't know how you felt about it, you know, I've, I'm still sort of torn about it. Yeah. But I, some, I guess, ultimately, I think that what it's done, it's made him, and now he talks to his mates about it, it's made them see the whole freshwater ecology completely different. And if he treats rivers differently because of his love for fish and fishing i'm not sure how i feel about that i think that's probably quite a positive thing i mean this chat what do you think yeah so what i would say so i i was basically you've just described my childhood so i i was catching frog spawn and beetles and you know climbing up trees and getting mucky and then I, when i was about 11 I, I got a kind of cheap shitty rod from um woolworths i didn't really know how to do it but i gave it a go and that that act of catching a fish and having it in your hands was just incredible because at that time I wasn't snorkeling in the rivers and, and whatever. So I think it does teach you a lot about different species of fish and where they live. Given the choice now, I'd much rather be in the water and snorkel with them than fish, but I do still fish now. Um, you mentioned like the animal right side to it. You know, does, does a hook in its mouth and dragging it out of the water do it and it's good? No, not not particularly. But they go back alive, they don't die. I mean, people call it fishing a blood sport. I think that's probably a little bit uh, extreme because we don't kill the subject. Mo most anglers, the UK is quite unique in that we're one of the few countries where most fish go back. We don't really eat fish, we just do it for sport. And the way I look at it is the amount of money that uh, rod licenses generate, millions and millions of pounds goes back into river restoration, um, restocking rivers if there's been a pollution incident. So... I think it's a fair trade-off. Yeah, I mean, do, do, do fish feel pain? I think they do. They've got a nervous system to, to a degree. Do they feel it in the same way as us? And are there long-lasting damages to fish being caught? I don't think so. It's, it's a very difficult thing to say, but on the whole, I don't think it's a bad thing. And I think the good outweighs the bad for it. That, that's my opinion on it. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right. And you know, when you, you know, if it's a way of getting kids just seeing the natural world in a different way and are more enthusiastic about it, then I guess it's, is it a small price to pay a few silver fish being hooked out the river uh, for the sake of enthusiasm and a love? Because I mean, again, like you say, I've brought my rod license. I've joined the local uh, fisheries group. You know, the Fish the Anglers Association. So I've put money back into. And if they then protect the banks and the fish, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm still sort of torn about it, but it's just difficult. It's just difficult. The lad, you know, he loves it. And, yeah. Uh, he, now, rivers in a way that maybe he wouldn't have done if he hadn't have found this love of fishing. So, and when your kids come to you, you know, you, you could, it's like, I guess, with kids, they say if they've not grasped a love of the outdoors by the age of eight, chances are they won't get it again until they're in the late 20s or early 30s. So I think if anything that, 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 that switches kids on to the outdoors is probably a good thing for me. Yeah, I, I mean, if you think about it, how many pastimes do you have where you sit by a riverbank all day and just in one spot and take it in? And, and apart from bird watching, or, or even then, most bird watchers don't sit in one spot all day. They walk around the reserve. But to just be in one spot and breathe it in, the amount of wildlife, and I've never normally got my camera, which is kind of typical, but you'll see the kingfishers going by, the dippers, the water voles. It's, it's fantastic. Well, that's it. He calls he's now he calls the kingfish before he sees them because he hears them like me. You know, he's got, he's got his, his water birds have got a lot better. You know, he's got, he's got into his dragonflies, his damselflies as well. So, and I think it's that time of your parents and your offspring. It's good quality bonding time. You know, I mean, all right, I'm going to say dad and lad because that's what we are, but there's no reason why, you know, it has to be a male pursuit by any means. You know, if there are, no. there's some great birds out there, I believe. You know, and so, um, yeah, I just think it's quality time between adults and pet and, and kids, really. You know, it's really good for uh, for your mental health as well. I I find it because I, I mean the, yeah. the photography and the bird watching's great, but that's almost like that's my job. So you treat it slightly differently. But the fishing, I don't take a camera. So I, when I do do that, it's just a time to recharge and breathe it in. And um, I I love it. I think you know, I don't go very often, but when I do go, it's um, it's quite nice to kind of yeah get a chance. And, and again, I mean, you know, look at look, look at the whole White House and Mortimer program that's been them in the, into the third series now. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely and that is shot really well. It just shows, you know, at the British landscape off like no other program at the moment. I think it's just shot really well. It's well paced. You know, yeah, all right. I'm an old codger. They deal with old codgers' issues, so maybe I can relate to it a bit more. But it's just a fantastic. It's a really good, a really good show. Just coming back again to fake audio and films, okay. right? moment there's a massive massive movement for filming off speed and showing birds flying in slow-mo yes right? yeah as soon as you see a clip of any animal flying in slow motion you know the audio is fake because no camera no digital camera can record the audio off speed at the same time as the birds flying so a bit, I understand why a lot of cameramen do it, because it can make their two-second shot of a bird last for six seconds. But for me, as soon as I see a bird flying like this across screen, instant turn-off. Instant yeah. turn-off for me. Kids are going to grow up thinking birds fly like this. You know, it's just not happening. When they get on the reserve, they're wherever they're going to go, Dad, why is that bird so fast? Oh, uh, well, because, you know, the cameraman is off speed. Yeah. I don't know about under Jack, I don't know how much you do off speed. No, uh, quite well. I do a little bit, but it's often favoured off speed because, I mean, you can use a tripod underwater, but normally you're, you're hand holding it. So if you're, if you want to, well, like you just described, if you want to make this shot last a little bit longer and steady it, then <laughs> yeah, off speed. So a lot of it, a lot of underwater is off speed actually. Yeah. So we're guilty of it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's got its place, but not yeah. if the bird's flying straight. Let's have it off speed. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Like, you know, obviously things like, you know, uh, let's say kingfisher diving, let's talk about osprey, you know, yeah, there are, diff there are some occasions when it's, but I think it's used a little bit too much at the moment. And for me, as a record, this is a turn off because I know the sound they put over is all fake. Yeah. But that's my, other, that's my other little moans about fake sound. <laughs> it's definitely, uh, this has been like therapy for you, Gary, hasn't it, today, really? We've been able to get all this off your chest. <laughs> ah, yeah, wait till I retire. Wait till the book comes out, then you'll know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wildlife sound unplugged, that's what it would be. Again, in the industry, that'll be it. I'll make too many enemies, I'll never work again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been great to chat to you. Fantastic. Nice one, Jack. Take it easy, mate.
Now that was Gary Moore talking a little bit about wildlife sound recording and I look forward to his book which is quite possibly going to derail wildlife filmmaking as we know it so that'll be that'll be great when that comes out. Now next week I'm talking to Steve Simpson. Now he is a professor at the University of Exeter in their biosciences department and he's been studying how fish can talk to each other. Some amazing work he featured on Blue Planet 2 on the coral reef so we're going to have a little chat about how fish talk how they make the noises that they make and why noise pollution is a really difficult issue for many of these species i hope you've enjoyed today's podcast this has been the bearded tits podcast i've been your host jack perks and i will see you next tuesday cheers <laughs>